All right, so uh, welcome back. We'll uh, continue here. We've uh, touched on the subject of intercession, uh, but in this second session, we will go a little deeper in intercession itself. Okay, so there is a deeper intercession or a deeper way of praying for others, and uh, we'll uh, look at what the scriptures have to say about it. So the Bible mentions a kind of intercession which is known as travail okay travail now i don't know if you're familiar with this word but for those of us who um, uh, don't understand that word travail uh, it is it is like um, you know when when a mother gives birth to her child uh, we know there's incredible pain Okay. And in that intensity, we know the, the cries and the groans that, that uh, come out, right? Uh, so that is what travail is. So it's an intense way of suffering to release something. So we've already discussed that when we intercede, we see God's mercy being given to someone or God's grace coming upon someone or God's victory, uh, um, you know, in their lives. So something is being released. Yes or no? When we, when we intercede? Correct. Now, the deeper form of intercession or travail, it's very similar to a mother giving birth because, uh, you know, a mother, she would carry the... Uh, the uh, unborn child for about nine months and uh, uh, it's only when she goes into labor or she's in pain okay and very close to the birth of the child that there is that intense struggle uh, intense struggle for her to uh, you know put in all her energy and for the child to come out but those moments of that struggle and you know her um, uh, cries and her groans is what is known as travail Okay, so when we talk about intercession, we can intercede um, uh, to say, okay, God, please bless this person. Okay, God, please heal this person, um, you know, uh, prosper them. That's fine. But these are all prayers which are at, the, uh, you could say, maybe at the top layer where, yes, we feel for them. We do have compassion, but it's not necessarily travailing where we are struggling, where we are in, we are also in pain to make sure that God's answers are released in that person's life. But when we go to that level, okay, that's why I'm saying it's a deep level where we are travailing for others. And usually we use the term travail when we um, talk about, you know, praying for the lost, those who are, you know, those who are away from God. Uh, when remember I said John Knox of Scotland, uh, or uh, you have people like um, Evan Roberts. Uh, I mentioned Evan Roberts, right? The the person who uh, prayed for Wales, and there was a revival. He was also a Bible college student, and he didn't have an opportunity. But finally, you know, they they um, uh, got him to pray, and uh, eventually a revival took place because he was so committed to. Prayer. Now, these were all people who uh, were not just praying at the surface level. Okay, God, if you do, fine. If you don't do, it's fine. You know, it wasn't like that. But there was a burden. We talk about a burden. Burden is something that you sense spiritually, uh, which, uh, um, you know, it, it bothers you. That you can't just leave situations as they are, but you begin to pray. Like even about Evan Roberts, it, it is said that he was a young man and, uh, you know, he would walk around in his uh, place. Even when he used to walk around, apparently his mouth will be moving. And people used to tell him, what is wrong with you? You know, behave your age, you're young. What is this praying, praying all the time? And he would be like, you won't understand. Just leave it. But he was praying. He was praying for whales. He was praying for the people. He was praying for the lost because he carried that burden. Okay. So, travail is that deeper level of prayer where there is a suffering involved. It, it's a spiritual suffering. We're not talking about any physical suffering, but it's a spiritual suffering which we are willing to go through, just like a mother who goes through that travail to give birth 
to her child. So that is what travail is. It is intercessory prayer, but it is intercessory prayer of the deepest kind. Now, uh, in the life of Jesus, we know that Jesus engaged in prayer at all levels. Uh, so even travail, uh, he engaged in that. At the time when Lazarus was dead, okay, uh, the Bible says in front of the tomb of Daz Lazarus, Jesus groaned, right? He, he was sad. Uh, Jesus wept and he groaned in front of the, um, uh, the tomb of Lazarus. So what does it show us? It shows us that somewhere he has been through that intensity in prayer, right? After which, when he said, Lazarus, come forth, the dead man came alive, okay? So even Jesus engaged in a deep level of prayer from time to time. We find um, uh, in the garden of Gethsemane, do you remember how did Jesus pray? Any idea? Any thoughts? With uh, blood tears. That's right. So Jesus was so um, moved or uh, uh, he was so burdened, you know, bothered by what was coming up that he prayed, but he was sweating blood. Okay. So we can only imagine the, the state that he was in. He did go and tell his friend, his disciples, pray with me, pray with me. But they were sleeping because that that hour, that night was, it's a very difficult night for Jesus. So even Jesus, you know, he knew what travailing meant. It's a deep level of intercession, going before the Lord in prayer and crying out to God. So we associate it with intensity. Okay, intensity means what? Intensity means uh, seriousness. Intensity means, um, you know, like a deep, um, uh, yeah, better word? Passion? Yeah. Yeah, passionate. Passion. These are all the words that we uh, use to explain travail. So even Jesus engaged in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see in other passages also um, that, you know, Jesus, Jesus did this. It was nothing foreign to him. So whenever there was a requirement, you know, Jesus went into this mode of praying. Uh, Hebrews 5 verses 7 and uh, 7 through 10. There it says with cries, right? With vehement cries, meaning you can imagine somebody crying and, you know, have you seen a child um, that, okay, just imagine, right? Uh, um, like, um, or what do you say? If let's say they, they fall down or they hit their, maybe the, between the door, they just jam their finger. How do they cry? They'll just cry loudly and then they'll just like sort of, you know, take a deep breath and keep crying, keep crying till they find solace, till they find that um, uh, peace, right? Uh, somewhat like that before the Lord, when, um, you know, the Lord Jesus went through his difficult times, it says, with vehement cries, meaning it was intense, it was deep, it was not easy. Even Jesus has cried before the Father to, to um, see to it that so many things, in, whether in his own life or whether in his ministry or, um, you know, anything else, uh, or for the world, because we know he prayed for all of us, right? He prayed even for us who will come later and believe in him. Jesus has prayed with cries uh, and uh, in that level of depth. Okay, so uh, it, it's not something that God wants us to do and uh, he has not done it. Uh, in fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was praying so intensely or travailing in prayer before the Father, uh, the, the Bible says that an angel, God sent an angel to strengthen him. So he must have been so emotionally, um, you know, broken at that time that uh, God even sent an angel to help him. Uh, in that moment or strengthen him in that moment. So we see all these things. Uh, even let's say when we are praying in the spirit, okay, Romans 8 verses 26, 27, we said, right, that uh, the spirit helps us in our weaknesses when we do not know how to pray. Right? Uh, the Bible says with groans and sighs, sometimes, sometimes 
uh, there may not even be words, but there might be, um, you know, like a deep prayer coming out just through the cries. I remember I had prayed uh, for one um, brother who was, uh, I mean, he's a recent convert, like for many years he worshipped some other gods and all, but he accepted the Lord and in our church we have Holy Spirit baptism, right? Every, um, I think every month or every alternate month we have one Sunday, so people stay back and we pray for them. So on one Sunday when this particular brother stayed back and we prayed for him, uh, we have seen many different kinds of manifestations of baptism in the Holy Spirit. People start speaking in tongues. Some people may even sing in tongues. So many things happen. But this was unique. Because when we prayed for him, you can think with me, he's like a mature person. He has two big sons already. But he was crying like a baby. And he's just groaning, groaning, sighing, crying. And we were all wondering, is this tongues? Is this, uh, you know, like, uh, is this praying in the spirit? The Bible does say groaning and sighs. So we just gave it some time. He went on, he went on crying, like it literally like a baby. He was just crying for a while. And then slowly some words came out. So then we understood, oh yeah, these utterances are from the Holy Spirit. He is praying in, praying in the spirit. So the Holy Spirit sometimes, he gives us these groans, groans, uh, sighs, um, you know, weeping, crying, travail. Even that comes from the Holy Spirit because there is that intensity in some of those prayers, which only God knows that it is needed. So we may find ourselves, you know, in tears when we are some praying in the Spirit sometimes, but allow the Holy Spirit to lead, lead you. It's okay. It's fine. Maybe the Spirit of God wants us to um, uh, intercede powerfully. So when we travail like this, what we are doing is we use the word pressing in. Okay, Pressing in is you're uh, struggling a little bit to make it happen. Okay, it's, it's not like, okay, pray for one hour, leave it, come. It's not like that. You've already gone into to the depth of that prayer. And you need a little more spiritual energy to stay there, to fight it out. Okay, maybe fight it out is a better word. So pressing in is you're fighting it out in the spirit. Right? You're fighting it out in prayer at the deepest level. Uh, so there are some prayers which will be like this and God will lead us into these prayers. Now it is important to do this because... We will see later some scriptures. It say that unless we go to that depth, we will not give birth to the promises of God. If we always remain in surface level prayer, no travail, you know, no intensity, uh, we will not release okay, some of the things that God wants to release. Even Paul, you know, he writes to the uh, Galatians, Galatians 4 and verse 19. He says, I travail, I travail for you. Why? Why is he travailing? So that Christ be formed in you. So Paul is a minister of God. And what is his ministry? As an apostle, as a teacher, um, he is working hard so that people can um, transform themselves according to the word of God, according to the spirit of God. So he's saying, I'm laboring. I'm even travailing so that Christ will be formed in you. That is the goal, isn't it? For all of us to become more like Jesus. So that's what Paul is saying. That he is actually laboring for the people. He is um, uh, striving in prayer. He's striving in prayer. And even for us today, okay, for the lost, we can travail. Now, if we are called in into this kind of ministry, like full-time ministry. Now, ministry is not only uh, in the church. Ministry is not only preaching. Okay, God may call us in um, the work world, the business world. It's okay. Even that is ministry. There's nothing wrong with, you know, being a minister of God in the workplace. But we must labor for God. No matter where we are, we must labor for God and sometimes it's going to require for us to intercede at the deepest level and even travail. 
so that God's purposes are fulfilled. So it's a spiritual activity, okay, travailing. I told us that uh, travailing is like, it's like suffering in the inner man. Outside we may look fine, but in our spirit man, you know, there is that struggle, there is that pain, there is that suffering in prayer and we are fighting it out, okay, to uh, see um, maybe that person who is lost come back to God or that person who is sick healed or that person who is addicted for them to be set free, but we are struggling in prayer and, uh, you know, we will see what God does for us. Now, a few more things for us to note is that um, in John 7, 38, Jesus said, out of your belly, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay, so God is saying that he will release something from inside us for the world to be blessed with. In this context, it is the Holy Spirit. What is rivers? Rivers of living water has to do with the flow of the Holy Spirit. It will come out of every believer when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Out of your belly, belly is your inner man, from your spirit man, will flow the, um, the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to the people. Now, another word that we must understand is this word belly, it's also um, used as another word which is womb, okay, womb. Womb is um, the place where a child, you know, a, a child is formed, uh, a baby is conceived. So, in a way, when God is saying out of your belly, right, it's also that God is saying out of your womb shall come forth the release of the promises of God. So, who is God's womb here on the earth? It's God's people. Only through God's people, kingdom work can be released. Yes or no? Through each one of us. So, if God wants something to be released, it has to be born in us. It has to be conceived in us. Then only it will be released in the world. So, all of us as believers, we have a responsibility. Okay, those things being conceived in us is okay. But we also have to give birth to it. And no birth happens without travail. So there has to be some level of that inner suffering in prayer, which you and I have to go through, whether for ourselves, for our ministry, for our church, our land, we have to. Only then can we give birth to God's promises. So the church or the people of God are the womb of God. And we must engage in travail to give birth to his promises. That's the way God works. So in our lives, if we just, um, you know, limit ourselves to just two minute prayers, you know, like two minute noodles, <laughs> just two minute prayers and no, nothing more than that, you will never go into this level. The deep level of praying, interceding, we'll never reach that. But when we open ourselves up to praying, then God can help us journey to deeper levels in prayer, which are known as travail. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how, you know, God really wants us to uh, serve him, to release his promises. So let's look at a few more things with regard to travail, and then we can discuss if you have any questions. Um, so the Bible also tells us when Elijah, uh, again and again, we're coming back to the example of Elijah, uh, Elijah, a man of God, he already had the word of God. Okay, God said it will rain. But even when we have the promise of God, what did we say? We are supposed to pray. Okay, uh, without prayer, is it possible for God's uh, prophetic word to be fulfilled? What do you think? Yes or no? Okay, see, God is gracious. Sometimes, sometimes it may still happen. However, we, when we study the prophetic, we say this. Every prophetic word, every personal prophecy is conditional, which means 
that uh, when God says something, for example, let's say God, you know, gives us a word, you are going to be a great preacher. Now, without the cooperation of that person, God is not going to push him to become a preacher. That person has to cooperate. He has to, um, you know, be dedicated to God, learn the word, step out in ministry, operate in the gifts of the spirit. All the hard work has to come from the person. Now, if that person doesn't do it, even though there is a prophetic word that he will be a preacher, he may never be a preacher. Don't blame God for that. But there was a word, there was a prophetic word. Every personal prophecy is conditional, meaning there are conditions. If you, if we do this, do that, only then it will be fulfilled. You got it? So when God gives us a revelation, we are supposed to pray through. Elijah knew that. He knew it. That's why. When he knew that it is going to rain, he did not keep quiet. He went and he started praying. He said, God, you said it's going to rain. So let it rain. Let it rain. Let it rain. And how does he pray? He puts his head between his knees. That's what the Bible says, right? He puts his head between his knees and he's praying, praying. Now, notice, we don't know how long he prayed. It only says seven times he prayed. Seven times uh, for one hour, for two hours, for two days. We don't know. How long did he pray? Nobody knows. But one thing we know, he travailed. There's a man who is travailing to ensure that God's purpose is fulfilled. Okay? It's a it's little difficult to understand. How can that be? When God has already spoken, it should happen. Why should a man pray? But God is saying, he's looking for a man, he's looking for a woman to pray, to stand in the gap. Okay? So there is the, remember we said, man has to co-labor, co-labor with God. So God will do, God will give his word, but we are supposed to do the work here. We are supposed to labor with God. So Elijah started to pray. And the Bible even says he travailed. So when he travailed, that's when after seven times, there was some result. He saw a cloud emerging in the sky. Um, and um, in this way, when the church of God, we are the church, right? We are all the church. When the church travails, that is when we will give birth to the promises of God. So there are scriptures. Um, I'm not reading out every scripture here. Isaiah 66 verse 7 and 8 uh, and Hebrews 12 verses 18 and 23. It talks about the travailing of Zion, the travailing of Israel and the birth of, uh, you know, what God's purpose is. Uh, so we need to allow ourselves to travail for others and as i was saying we can have the uh, work of the holy spirit uh, in our hearts and through that we can travail now uh, let's talk about the holy spirit see the holy spirit when we go back to the book of genesis we find the father the son the holy spirit they are together they want to create the world okay where was the holy spirit at that time what does the Bible say? He was hovering over the waters, right? He was hovering over the waters. Now this word hovering, it is like, um, uh, you know, it's a reproductive term. So we find that sometimes what do a certain, uh, you know, what certain birds do is they kind of, they are, they'll give warmth to their eggs. Right? They kind of, they'll just be around, they'll hover over. Um, they are young ones. Only then will it produce. It'll hatch and then you'll have your, um, you know, your little birds uh, there. In the same way, when we read about the Holy Spirit hovering, it's a reproductive term. Okay? So when we talk about um, prayer and praying deeply, we've been saying that uh, we are the womb of God. But we need the work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a birthing agent. You understand? The Holy Spirit is a birthing agent. That's why the term is used, he was hovering. So when the Holy Spirit comes and he hovers upon us, he will give birth to the 
purposes of God. Maybe we'll get a new dream or a new vision or, you know, a new decision. Uh, and we think, hey, yeah, actually, that's what I'm supposed to do. How did we get it? The Holy Spirit is the birthing agent of God. He will birth new dreams, new visions in our hearts. And then we are supposed to go ahead, pray, right? Labor, like that woman who gives birth, travail, deep travail. And then finally, as the womb of God, we will be able to uh, grow that, uh, uh, you know, child or the baby and then release it out. So that's the way in which God wants to work in our lives. And so God is looking for people with some intensity, okay, with some seriousness. Um, it's okay to have people, you know, with a little bit of a casual attitude initially, but ultimately God likes, you know, it's like uh, we say um, God means business. You got it? Uh, we can't play with God. We can't just have like this whole casual engagement with God. Like, okay, God, when it benefits me, when it's convenient, I will serve you. Other times, you know, please give me a break. I'll come back whenever I feel like God, God's not like that. He likes some seriousness. He likes that commitment, right? Where we are saying, okay, God, um, I'm with you, whatever it is, right? Let's take the leap. Now, I want us to think about this man called Jacob. There was a time in Jacob's life. Obviously, he's not perfect, right? Jacob, what do we know him as? He's the deceiver. Jacob, the deceiver. He even cheated his brother and uh, he took the blessing of his brother. And, uh, you know, he lived his life, he prospered. And finally, he decided, okay, I'll go back. I'll meet my brother on the way back. To meet his brother in Genesis 32 there is a certain incident that happens so he sends all the groups before him and he's just there and what happens he has an encounter with God and he finds uh, in the night that um, uh, he's actually wrestling a heavenly being he's wrestling with God but what did Jacob do what did he do he did something. What did he want? Did he let go? Did he let go of his grip when he was wrestling with, with God? He had a very strong hold on, on, on God and uh, he was not ready to let go. Then what did he say? He said, I will not leave you till you bless me. You have to bless me. Otherwise, I won't leave you. His hold was so tight that, you know, God actually, uh, we read that he, he got a limp. Uh, and that's how uh, God even sort of, you know, went away from this wrestle. Uh, but why are we talking about this? You see, that's a physical wrestling, right? But what we want to share right now is that God wants us in the spiritual, in the spiritual um, things, in the inner man, to be like Jacob. Okay? So when we pray, we need some intensity inside where we are telling God, I will not leave you till you bless me. Think about Jacob. He just didn't let go. And you know what? God really loved it. He liked it so much. How do we know that God liked that attitude of that seriousness? intensity which Jacob had. Yes, Jacob was a deceiver and so many things happened in his life. Um, but obviously, when you know, he started coming back to God, surrendering to God, God changed his life and God blessed him as Israel. But one thing we can learn from Jacob today is that grip which he had on God. And today we can have a spiritual grip in prayer on God, where we should not let go of God and, uh, you know, say that we really want him to bless us. Now, I told us God was happy with it because you find the prophet Hosea, he talks about Jacob. He talks about Jacob. He talks about Jacob in uh, Hosea 12, verse 3 to 6. And again, in um, Obadiah 1, verse 17, 
I'll quickly read it and I'll explain it to us. So in Hosea 12, verses 3 to 6, it says about Jacob, he took his brother by the heel in the womb and in his strength he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel and there he spoke to us. That is the God of hosts. The Lord is his memorable name. So you, by the help of your God, return. Observe mercy and justice and wait on your God continually. So what does it say about Jacob? It says, in his strength, he struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept. So what is that? Something like travail, isn't it? Struggle. He wept. He sought favor from God. He sought favor from God. Now in Obadiah 1.17, it says, But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Now think about this. Two prophets. God is speaking through two prophets. And God is saying, God is mentioning about the wrestle. See, if something is not special to God, he won't mention it again. He mentions Jacob wrestled, he struggled with God. Second thing, he mentions in Obadiah, he says, the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. That means that blessings will be there. Okay? Now, God could have said the house of Abraham will have all the blessings or the house of Isaac will have all the blessings or something else. The house of, pick some other name, Joseph will have the blessings. But God is saying the house of Jacob, the house of Jacob will have the blessings. Why? Because it was Jacob who told God, you have to bless me. I won't leave you till you bless me. And God has answered his prayers and he's saying, yes, I will bless this man because he's so intense with me, right? So these are the deeper levels of intercession where we should have a strong grip on God. This grip, it's not like that wrestling grip, like we can't really check it out, like how strong it is. But spiritually, spiritually, uh, it's something we can sense, like how serious am I? God bless me. Think about Esau and Jacob. You know, the Bible says, Jacob he loved, but Esau he hated. Why? Why does it say like that? Any idea? Why does it say like that? God is not partial, right? Then why, why is it like that? Because Esau was not a believer. Okay. Yeah. Correct, uh, sister. So we see that Esau... He was playing with God's purpose for his life. You remember the time when they were hungry uh, and, uh, you know, Esau comes back from uh, hunting and um, then Jacob says, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you uh, food, um, but I want your birthright. Esau has no regard for what God, the birthright is very serious. It's like the call of God on Esau's life. It's the purpose of God for Esau's life. He's so careless about it. He's saying, okay, whatever, take my birthright, just give me something to eat. God didn't like it. God said, hey, this, this man is playing with my purpose. He's playing with my uh, call. He's playing with my blessings. Playing with, you know, the spiritual promises that I have for him. And that's not correct. So God doesn't like that. But look at his brother Jacob. He knows he's not perfect, but he's saying, God, whatever you have for me, you have to give it to me. I don't know. I may not be perfect, but bless me. I won't let you go. So here is one brother. He's careless with God's purpose. But here is the other brother. He's so serious about God's purpose. And God says, I like this. I like those who are sincere, earnest, serious about what I want for them in their lives. Okay, are you all getting what I'm trying to say? It's too deeper. 
too deep deep level of intercession uh, might probably be too much to handle okay fine so if you've understood that much i think we'll uh, stop there you probably would have got it but one more thing i'll tell you this travail remember i said it's a deep way of praying so there is a person by the name of uh, uh, father nash father nash okay uh, have you all heard about um, charles finney you should have heard because there is a picture hanging here in the campus so charles finney is one of the great preachers of the you know uh, great awakening so it is said that whenever he used to preach people used to run and come like they'll cry you can imagine the scene so charles finney is preaching they'll all cry run and come accept christ hundreds of people in front okay so uh, people but i mean charles finney has that great name oh what a wonderful preacher you know many people got saved but here's the other part of the story charles finney had a man as a team member uh, by the name of father nash no he, he was not very old maybe like 30 late 30s 40s something like that so father nash what did father nash do father nash's uh, passion was to pray for charles finney so now wherever charles finney decides to go what father nash used to do is he used to take two or three people with him he'll take them and these people will go to that city before finney comes they'll go maybe one month before or two months before and what they used to do is they will rent a house and over there they used to start praying okay and it is said that father nash and team they used to pray so much that some days they won't even eat so uh, it seems once the person who rented the house for father nash um, told finney that uh, please go and check what is going on because they are not coming outside the house and i can only hear people crying inside why why were they crying they were travailing for lost souls that was how the ministry of the intercessor father nash was so what finney says is that the reason his crusades were so powerful is because father nash and his team were travailing for many days weeks and months that is when souls were being saved okay but at one point father nash died okay he died um and uh, finney says after that he tried the crusades but not those many people were saved it was nothing compared to how it was when nash used to pray for him right uh, and apparently you know after trying many things uh, finney actually sort of gave up doing these crusades uh, because he didn't see the power that he used to see earlier but the point is here's the point the point is someone is travailing and you can see the power of god at move when there were people praying right for the ministry for the evangelism so even today whenever we do things remember remember you need like a power backup right how are we going to get it when we engage in prayer in general and the, the deep level of prayer in travailing okay so um this is how even in the past when we read about any revival you'll find there were people who were very sincere in prayer they even went to the deep level of prayer they cried and it is said about father nash it seems once somebody checked like what is going on in this house why are people crying when they kind of looked through they saw uh people were all on the floor like flat your flat on your face and crying out to god like that for two days three days weeks they they used to cry to god and no wonder you know today we have all the pictures and all hanging because god worked powerfully through their lives right but there's so much for us to learn uh from their example and uh, their experiences so let me just stop here if you have any questions we can answer about travel
too deep huh? <laughs> too deep yes hmm okay so during prayer uh, like what do we generally do we have the same tongues or does it change that's what you're asking okay so uh, it can change um, joseph but for some people it may remain the same also but you don't worry about that because we are only like sort of releasing the utterances that the holy spirit is giving us so surely your prayer is being heard so that you don't have to worry no matter how your tongue sounds right uh, and also tongues is like it's like a human language in many ways uh, when we are baptized in holy spirit at that point we may speak one word two words like how children baby speak right like just one word two word slowly they'll speak one sentence they'll speak two three sentences so the more we pray in tongues the more we pray in the spirit you'll find that you're speaking lot of words so it takes time so just keep practicing that's all sure right so um there is a question on the chat here uh, brother sanjay could you give us an example of how not to be like esau maybe some real life examples where people have lost their calling okay um Uh, i don't know if i can comment on uh, uh, like with names of people who have lost their calling mm. i think there are uh, it's a little bit of a tricky subject uh, brother sanjay because even though like to our perception we we see that someone is far away from god uh, i don't know if i can state uh for sure that you know they have fallen away or uh they they no longer are saved that's between god and them right but i can always tell you um you know giving up on our um spiritual blessings and our calling uh right examples mm, examples of people okay maybe how about you guys you have any examples that are coming to your mind right away giving up on your calling i remember um, you know somebody like katherine kulman we spoke about um, katherine kulman one of our uh, sessions here on campus uh, and we said that uh, there were some things that went wrong in her life and after that she stopped preaching um because she felt that she is just not you know acceptable uh, among the people acceptable by god um but eventually you know god helped her to come back and to minister so yeah i can only think of her right now i'm sorry i'm not able to give you any other names oh yeah yeah uh charles oh, uh, uh alex alexander davi okay alexander davi so uh, in the life story of alexander um, john alexander davi we you can read about him he was so strong in god and many things were right but he started preaching error okay so that is something that you can um, look at so he kind of went away um, passionate but you know sincerely wrong with his doctrine eventually so i can also think of him right now so maybe you can just go ahead and you know read about these people and see what happened in their lives uh, is that okay brother sanjay okay sure thank you i can see the question bubbling but it's not coming out so oh 
हाँ या या करेक्ट यस यस श्योर यस यस yeah so i heard um, someone say about empathy and sympathy you know when they teach emotional intelligence they say um, uh, which one yeah putting yourself in the shoes of another person so uh, they use this this example they said uh, it's like empathy imagine a child gets hurt okay uh, uh, and uh, i mean i'm not i'm not promoting this but i'm just saying i heard this uh, the dad says oh so sad okay and the mother says ouch meaning she feels the pain whereas somebody is just observing the child and saying oh that child is going through pain so sympathy is when you look at another person's pain from your view perspective but empathy is when you feel it like as if they would feel it so that is empathy so what akil is saying is uh, in intercessory prayer uh, empathy is so necessary yeah sure but also uh, akil there's a there's always for everything no there's a limit okay so we feel for them but at the same time after we have done our praying and everything um, the ball is in their court like they also have to take responsibility you know what i mean so um we can't keep doing their um responsibility we can't take it upon ourselves so much because we'll see like especially in leadership we deal with so many people we take we carry everyone's pain you know we take their burdens but there we need to know how to uh yeah know the limit otherwise it's going to be very difficult because you're feeling for the whole world and then you're just a human being right we are so limited so yeah even to be so empathetic may not be healthy cool okay fine so i think uh, we don't really have many questions we can pray and um, close the class would anyone from our batch here like to pray can pass the mic right akil okay but the mic is here please use the mic let's pray Gracious, loving Lord, we thank you for enabling each one of us to be gathered here in your presence to learn your word, to learn your will, and also to meditate on what is being taught. We thank you for all the faculty who passionately teach and preach what they are called to. We pray for your presence and peace in this place, and that we pray that we will draw one step closer to you each passing day. we commit the rest of the day into your precious care in jesus mighty match the same we pray amen 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 thank you thank you akil thank you everyone god bless you uh, i trust that uh, you know you will go deeper in your intercession so bye for now we'll connect in our next class